Come on, let go. It's early. Where are you going? Where are you going? Come on. Wait a minute. I know some of y'all might be going in the comments and saying, hey, it's way too early to make a video about this. But you know what? I feel like for players that make a lot of money, this type of thing is not unfair to talk about. So today we're talking about the Vancouver Canucks and we're going over J.T. Miller, the guy who was re-signed to an $8 million AAV extension earlier in the offseason, that in which does not kick in until 2023-2024, and it ends when the guy is going to be in his late 30s, and I mean, there's the entire conversation to go out there with the contract. Oh, he had 99 points last year. Oh, he was so good last year. Oh, he was every second pass on the power play last year. And he got the bag because of it. Now, the thing is, with fans in this market, I think a lot of people are starting to understand this. If you're listening to Sportsnet 650 post-game shows, you're listening to what other Canucks fans are going out there and saying, what Satir Shaw and Dan Riccio are saying, what people on Twitter are saying, what a lot of folks in this area of the world have to say about JT Miller. You kind of understand that when players get paid a lot of money, there is a higher standard that applies to them and their play. Miller last year was a $5.5 million cap hit player who was playing significantly above that cap hit. But all Canucks fans could say was, hey, okay, I mean, he's producing a lot, but then again, is this really sustainable? Do you want to go out there and say that this is going to be a guy whom you could build around long term? Do you want to just trade him away? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Focus on the youth, whatever. We had made a lot of videos about Miller trade ideas, and I even said when the contract was signed that, okay, if this works... Like, if he is able to be a 99-point caliber player for the rest of the time he is in Vancouver, which he's probably not going to be. I mean, he's going to be 34, 35, 36, 37 when the contract expires. So, probably unlikely he'll be that Joe Pavelski who is able to consistently produce throughout those years. But, for now, the Vancouver Canucks made the signing and... I mean, at the time of recording the video where I was coming back from the post office and chilling out in my car, I was kind of like, okay, we'll see where this goes. And I was honestly kind of positive about it. But this season, there's been so much conversation about JT Miller and the fact, or not the fact, but the idea that he is not worth the money that in which he was given out earlier this offseason for the rest of the decade. And I just wanted to go out there and read this post made on the Canucks subreddit because of that. Spectrefire is the user who went out there and posted this. This is a very, very interesting Reddit post, so I want to read the entire thing for you just right here to get your opinions as well on JT Miller and how he's performed this season, as well as where everything looks to be trending towards. Now, before we read the post, I'll say this. Miller has 27 points in 31 games played, 11 goals, 16 assists. He is on pace for 71 points in 82 games played and being a minus 29. Now, for most NHL players, getting 71 points in 82 games played... I mean, is that worth $8 million a season? You could debate it should be, but here is where the Reddit post goes out there and illuminates some of where this production is coming from. JT Miller has zero goals in his last 10 games and has not scored at even strength since November 5th. His last goal was on November 26th against Vegas on the power play. Miller's last even strength goal was 20 games ago against Nashville on November 5th. Miller only has five even strength goals in the entire year and 13 even strength points. By contrast, Ilya Mikheyev has nine even strength goals on the year and 15 even strength points. If you account for how much time Miller plays 5-on-5, five five, he plays the most amongst forwards. He is one of the lowest goals per 60 amongst top 6 forwards on this team at a .55 goals per 60. Horvats, by contrast, is 1.52. Petey, 1.57. Mikheyev, 1.42. Even Dakota Joshua, a 1.1. Hoaglander, who got sent down yesterday on his birthday and who tried the Michigan in the Abbotsford Canucks game yesterday, is at a .62. Miller is the only forward on the team to have more power play points than even strength points. And by even strength production, Miller is currently the fifth most productive forward at 5-on-5, five five, while being the Canucks' highest paid player since Matt Sundin. That's a blast from the past now, isn't it? 
Yes, at face value, Miller is still productive this season with 27 points in 31 games, but he's relying so heavily on the power play to create that production that he's a borderline power play specialist for us this year. His low even strength scoring is also not helped by his disastrous defensive play, which has rewarded him with the team's second worst minus 11. Outside of the man advantage, Miller has been a net negative for the team this year. Now, of course, the highest paid player since Matt Sundin thing isn't there yet because he's not making the $8 million a season until 23-24. But still, the idea that JT Miller is going out there with very questionable, at best, five-on-five -five production and getting the majority of his points on the power play, that's something that's not really all too new. And if you looked at the videos that we had made about Miller the past few months, spanning back to last season, spanning back into the summer, I said the same thing. Part of the reason why Miller had so many freaking points, 99 points in 80 games last season, is because the guy was every second pass on the power play. Power play would always look like Miller to Hughes to PD back to Hughes to Miller. Then Miller would go down low to Brock and then it'd play out in front to Horvat. And then if Horvat took the shot, the rebound would be collected by Brock. He'd play it back to Miller. Miller back to Hughes. Hughes to Miller. Back to Hughes. Shot. Save made. Rebound out in front. Horvat scores. Miller gets the secondary assist. Miller was everywhere on the power play. And it's kind of nuts because even this season, like, sure, the guy's getting points there on the five on four. But at the same time, I feel like with the decline of power play production the Canucks have had, as of the past few games here, you're really starting to see Miller get, dare I say, exposed on the man advantage. Like, no bad passes in the national, bud. You make a lot of money. The turnover against the, what is it, the Minnesota Wild? That resulted in a shorthanded goal against. Then you have the other games where Miller is attempting to force that behind the back, no look backhand pass to Quinn Hughes. And it's getting picked off now more so than it ever has been. Spoiler alert, other teams watch the Canucks power play move around and they say, okay, Miller does that behind the back pass. And recently we had started to see that stop working as much because teams are reading it, they're intercepting it, and they're taking it out. But... JT Miller is a very questionable hockey player, especially when you realize how much money he is going to be making for this team. That word, it keeps on popping up, it's questionable. Now, whose fault is that? Is that the Vancouver Canucks' fault for not trading away Miller when you had the opportunity to get maybe Niels Lundqvist and a whole bunch of other stuff for him? Is it Miller's fault, per se, that he's starting to perform like this after signing the extension? Is it our fault for falling into the same trap year after year and seeing it manifest in front of ourselves, yet still paying attention, calling ourselves fans, and getting broken every time? Okay, I feel like that was an unnecessarily deep cut, but either way, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below about JT Miller and how he has performed this season. I used this example a few weeks ago when talking about, I believe it was like Brock Besser or something, but every time I meet up with some other friends I have, folks in different leagues that I'm a part of, etc, etc, hockey-related things, you know? And every time we talk about the Canucks, it's always, yeah, Besser has been playing poorly this season, so is Miller. Like, it's kind of odd, JT Miller had such a good reputation in this city after getting acquired by Vancouver in that 2019 draft day two trade and posting up the 70 point year that he had. He was amazing and a lot of people are like, wait, we traded away a first for this guy? That's awesome. Like, he's a really good player right now. And then he had the 99 point year. There was a year in the middle of that that we don't talk about because it was terrible, but he had 99 points and people were saying, wait a minute, the Canucks are not really all that great. They lost out into Foley, Tanev, and Markstrom. And now, I mean, if you trade Miller away, that wouldn't be a bad move, right? And then they re-signed him and it was like, okay. Some people were very skeptical about it at first. I was not, unfortunately. And now the skepticism is starting to arise. But uh, yeah, yeah. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below about this entire idea here. The link to the Reddit post by Spectrefire will be in the description if you want to go ahead and read this yourself more and more. But either way, thoughts in the comments about Miller. I know it's early. It's early! That's why I quoted Don John at the beginning of the video, because it's only been, like, a few months after the extension was signed. The extension hasn't even kicked in yet. We are in the negative one year of this extension. So... Maybe if Miller bounces back, he has 100 points this season, 100 points next season, then it's okay. Right? 
but is that really going to happen now? So that's in the comment section below. Hope you enjoyed this Vrishra Shrolls 99. And bye.